Greetings, fellow Whovians. Well, time for another Fifth Doctor episode review. So, we're gonna, today we're going to be taking a look at Frontios. So, here we go. The TARDIS lands in the far future on the planet Frontios, where some of the last vestiges of humanity are struggling for survival. The planet is being attacked by meteorite showers orchestrated by an unknown enemy responsible for the disappearance of several prominent colonists, including the colony's leader, Captain Revere. After witnessing Revere being eaten by the ground, Security Chief Brazen engages in a cover-up. To the public, Captain Revere dies, died of natural causes. After safe funeral, at after safe funeral, Revere's son, Plantagenet, assumes the leadership of the colony. The TARDIS is, is some seriously affected by a meteorite storm and dragged down to the planet by gravity. The Fifth Doctor, Tegan, and Turlo emerge, in the middle of the bombardment, to investigate. Despite his earlier reservations about getting involved, the Doctor violates the cardinal rule of the Time Lords by helping the colonists who were injured by the meteorite bombardment by providing medical assistance. Well, hey, he is called the Doctor, after all, so there's that. Meaning better light in the medical facility, the Doctor sends Tegan and Turlo to fetch a portable mu field activator and five Argon discharge globes from the TARDIS. However, once they arrive, they find that the ship's inner door is stuck, preventing them from getting beyond the console room. Lorna, Tegan, and Turlo obtain an acid battery from the research room to power the lights. On their way back, however, they are forced to render, to render, to render the warns men unconscious to avoid capture. Another bombardment occurs and, in the warns men's absence, catches the colony unawares. When the sky is clear, the TARDIS is gone seemingly destroyed. All that is left is the doctor's hat stand. Oh no! Plantagenet orders the execution of the doctor, but Turlo intercedes, brandishing the Tar's hat stand which the sellers take to be a formidable weapon. Plantagenet tries to attack the doctor with a crowbar but suffers a heart attack. The Time Lord manages to use his life to save his life using the battery but Plantagenet is later dragged into the ground by some mysterious force. Hmm. The Doctor, Tegan, and Turlo discover that the, cul discover that the culprits are the Gravis and his tractators, giant insects with incredible powers over gravity. Turlo briefly undergoes a sort of nervous breakdown because the tractators once attempted to invade his homeworld long ago. His mind contains a deep, horrific race memory of the event. The disappeared colonists are being used by the tractors to run their mining machines. Plantagenet was kidnapped to replace Captain Revere, the current driver who is now brain dead. The Gravis intend to transform Frontios into an enormous spaceship. Once successful, he would be able to spread the terror of the tractors across the galaxy. The Doctor, Turlo, Brazen, and his guards rescue Plantagenet by knocking out the Gravis. However, Brazen gets caught by one of the mining machines and is killed while the others escape. Tegan wanders around in the tunnels and comes across bits of the TARDIS inner, TARDIS's inner walls. She is chased by the Gravis, who has now regained consciousness, and two of his tractors. She and really comes upon one of the TARDIS's inner doors, and she opens it to find herself in the TARDIS console room, which has bits of rock while mixed in with its normal walls. She also finds the Doctor, Turlo, and Plantagenet congregated around the console. The Doctor ushers the Gravis in and then tra tricks him into reassembling the TARDIS by using his power over gravity. The Gravis pulls the TARDIS back to its normal dimension. Once fully assembled, the Gravis is effectively cut off from his fellow tractors, which revert to a harmless state. The Doctor and Tegan deposit the now dormant Gravis on the uninhabited planet of Kolkor. Cococron. Returning to Frontios, the Doctor gives Plantagenet the hat stand as a farewell token and asks that his own involvement in the affair not be mentioned to anyone, especially the Time Lords. Once the Taurus has left Frontios, its engines start making a worrisome noise. The Doctor appears to be helpless as the ship is being pulled, pulled towards the center of the universe. <laughs> so yeah, that was some pretty nice stuff that went on in that episode. So anyway, let's get some production notes here. Script, ed script editor Eric Sayward contacted writer Christopher H. Bidmead in July 1982 with a view to writing a script. Its original title was The Wanderers. 
The scripts were formally commissioned on November 26, 1982, under the title Frontiers. The scripts were delivered on February 16, 1983, except three weeks later, subject to some rewrites. The director was Ron Jones, who had directed three earlier Fifth Doctor stories. The designer sent his serial, Barry Dobbins died before production, later revealed as suicide, and was replaced by David Buckingham. He started the production on July 8, 1983, just six weeks before recording. Soon after this, another shot came to the production when actor Peter Arne, who had been hired to play Mr. Range, was murdered on August 1, 1983. This was just hours after he had attended a costume fitting for his character at the BBC. His murder was widely reported in the British media the following day, with many reports making, his, making mention of his upcoming part in Doctor Who. He was replaced by William Lucas. Other actors of note in Frontios included Peter Gilmore, who had found fame during the 1970s in the lead role of the 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 Wunden line. I guess that's how it's pronounced. It's O N E D I N. So correct me if I'm wrong about that in the comment section. Leslie Dunlop, who played Norna, was widely experienced, despite her being just 27, and went on to appear in Doctor Who again in 1988's The Happiness Patrol. Jeff Rawl, who had also found fame in the 1970s as Billy Liar, and later starred in the Sarah Jean Adventures story Mona Lisa's Revenge. It was during rehearsals for this story that Colin Baker was announced as a new actor, as Peter Davison had by this time decided to leave the show. Frontios was filled in two three-day recording blocks in the BBC Television Center's Studio 6 from August 24th to September 9th, 1983. Fidmin was instructed to include a monster in the script, something he wasn't happy about since it felt that Doctor Who monsters looked cheap and had limited dialogue. His two early stories, Logopolis and Castrovalva, featured no monsters. The director tours were inspired by wood lice, which had infested his flat. Dancers were hired to wear the tractor tour costumes with the idea that they would coil and twist their bodies in line with the idea of wood lice, but the costumes were too restrictive for this. The dancers were hired from Pineapple Studios. One glitch of the continuity of this of the series occurs in this story, as Companion Chameleon is missing when the TARDIS is destroyed. The writers of the discontinuity guide theorize he is, that he is disguised at the ha as the hat stand. Okay. Soon after the story is broadcast, Saber commissioned Ben Mead to write a story for season twenty three featuring the tractors and the master. This was ultimately abandoned as soon as the, as the season was soon cancelled. Frontiers proved to be his last televised story for Doctor Who. Well, that's kind of a bit of a bummer. So overall, I say this is a pretty unique episode, and yeah, that's pretty much what I can say about it. So overall, I give Frontios three sonic screwdrivers out of five. Well, join me next week as we take a look at Resurrection of the Daleks. <laughs> So until then, this is Hooping Queen saying, Oh my giddy aunt! When I say run, run! I've a recipe that I do the flow. Would you like a jelly baby? Fantastic! Alon Z! Geronimo! Bow ties are cool, vests are cool, and Stetsons are cool. <laughs>